Greetings and welcome to the 15th annual Creighton School of Law Omaha Bar Association Seminar on Ethics and Professionalism. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this is being presented virtually, which required the speakers to pre-record their remarks. Virtual events might have overlapping or redundant remarks, but I'm confident the editing skills of our esteemed director, Dave Summers, will minimize them. Thanks go out to the following people who are presenting this year. J. Scott Paul, this event was Scott's idea 15 years ago. It is the second best idea he has had, I think. The first was asking his wonderful wife to marry him. So Scott, what would you consider your third best idea to be? In addition to Scott's tried and true summary of cases highlighting lawyers who have derailed their careers by ignoring the ethical rules, we welcome and thank the following speakers for the time they have taken to educate us about ethics and professionalism. Professor Steve Severson, Kendra Fershe, Josh Fershe. This is my last official act as president of the OBA. Even though Judge Stephanie Hansen has taken the reins as of last month, despite my protest, Dave Summers wanted everyone to hear from me one last time. It's been my honor to serve this fine organization. As shocked and saddened as we were at the untimely death of Judge Lori Smithcamp, we find solace in having fulfilled her vision to educate fifth grade students about women's suffrage. This was done by following through with the work she started through generous donations, mainly from OBA members, over 300 copies of the children's book, Bold and Brave, 10 Heroes Who Won Women the Right to Vote, were purchased during the past year and given to fifth grade teachers starting with the Omaha Public Schools. This work reached three to 5,000 students. And that was just year one. Year two, we'll see the surrounding school districts receive copies of, this, of the book. Bellevue, Millard, Papillion La Vista, Ralston, Council Bluffs, to name a few. A special thanks goes to Linda Henningsen. Linda was involved with Judge Smith Camp in this program from the start, and its success could not have been achieved without her continued support. The OBA has gone from surviving during the pandemic to thriving. Thanks due to the efforts of Dave Summers. With Dave's perpetually positive attitude, he has helped the OBA accomplish the following. Mastering Zoom meetings, good thing for us, Dave is technologically savvy. Interviews, podcasts, starting a book club, restarting the Bench Bar Conference. Everyone should take advantage of the opportunity to hear judges talk about best practices. Organizing many CLE events that are free to OBA members. Coming up with the idea for Battle of the Bartenders that for the inaugural event, pitted Judge Hansen with her bourbon-based directed verdict against me and my rhubarberita. It was virtual fun over Zoom and helped us look past the gloom of the pandemic and get some fresh drink recipes. Thanks also goes to Jean Reeder, who has been a fixture with the OBA for many years, whether it be greeting us at events or helping out in other ways behind the scenes. And thanks to Donna Berkby, who has been with the OBA for 32 years and is our Lawyer Referral Services Coordinator. Donna bore the brunt of some nastier than usual callers during the pandemic. She has worked tirelessly to get a new system online that will update our current antiquated LRS software and make it easier for us lawyers to get referrals and provide the feedback that's needed to keep this important program running. If you're not a member of LRS, please join. My thanks would not be complete without mentioning Bob McGowan, who has worked on the Douglas County Law Library Foundation for many years, doing everything from annual tax returns to the corporate minutes. And J. Terry McNamara, who is the holder of our institutional knowledge and lends his insight at critical times. And the Daily Record and its new publisher, Jason Huff, managing editor, Scott Stewart, and staff writer, photographer, David Goldbitz, to name a few of the new faces. The Daily Record supports many activities, such as the annual steak fry for one, which had Judge Hansen and me, flipping steaks over flaming grill at Hanska Park earlier this year. If you missed that event, then don't miss next year's. The OBA's strength comes from Dave and Donna and the many other people who devote their time to keep the wheels turning. Through their dedication, the jobs of the officers are made easier. For those of you participating in this seminar who are members, thanks. For those of you who are not members, please join. For you young lawyers who are looking for a way to get involved, become a part of OBA's leadership by serving on one of its many committees. Contact Dave Summers about how you can help the OBA. We plan to have next year's event in person, so look for that in April 2022. Thanks for attending. I now turn the program over to the rest of the people in charge. Stay well.
Hello, I'm Josh Frasche, the Dean of Creighton University School of Law, and I'm happy to welcome you to the 15th Annual Creighton School of Law Omaha Bar Association Seminar on Ethics and Professionalism. I know it will be a great program, it always is, but I'm sorry that once again, we cannot join each other in the same space. It seems like we're working in the right direction, but it's still gonna take time. The past year was a hard one for so many in our community. The global pandemic has created physical and mental health challenges, as well as financial challenges that have affected our students, our university, and our legal profession. I'm proud of the way we have responded, and I'm confident we will continue to work together to move forward. At Creighton Law, we are back in school and back on campus. More than 98% of benefited faculty and staff are vaccinated, and the university mandated vaccines for all students except for rare medical exceptions. More than 94% of students are fully vaccinated, and that number should reach 99% by mid-October. For this year, law schools nationwide saw an increase in applications, and that increase led to larger first-year classes for many schools. That was certainly true for Creighton. We have an incoming class of 155 first-year students, and is the largest and strongest academic class since 2009. More important, we have more outstanding people to join our impressive second and third-year students. Over the past 15 months, we have managed well in less than ideal circumstances, and we've been able to offer a positive and productive learning environment. I'm proud of our students, faculty, and staff, and I'm excited and optimistic about what's next for Creighton Law. My thanks to all of you in our profession for your support and assistance, and I hope you enjoy the great program we have for you this year. My thanks to Scott Paul, Steve Sieberson, Kendra Fourche, Dave Summers, and the many others involved in making this event happen. My good thoughts to you all, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Sieberson from the Creighton Law Faculty. It is good to see you virtually or for you to see me. I guess I can't see you at all. No, Dave, we're going to start that over. I've got to get my watch set up here so I can follow the time. So here we go again. Hello and welcome to the annual OBA Creighton Law School seminar, ethics seminar. We've been doing this for a while, as you know, and I'm happy to be uh, speaking to you today. Uh, as we were planning for this seminar, uh, it was suggested that maybe we do a, an overview of the entire set of rules of professional conduct. And uh, that sounded like a good idea and I volunteered to do it. So here it is. Now I'm calling it a drone's view of legal ethics. Um, the drone obviously is a popular toy these days and it gives us a chance to get up above things and see it. However, a drone can also mean a parasitic loafer or a drudge. And I'm certain that my students think about me that way from time to time. So uh, nevertheless, I am going to drone on about the uh, rules of professional conduct. So the, um, there we go. The outline is going to be as follows. I'll do a run through all of the rules. Literally, it'll be like a, an oral table of contents to the rules of professional conduct. And I will remind you as we go through here that we need to remember that each of these rules has extensive official comments and they have lots of help for us. I won't have time to go into those. There's just too much material. Now, frankly, any one of us at any time could sit down and run through all these rules just to remind us of what is there, but we never do. So uh, we felt it would be worthwhile for this uh, seminar to do it. Uh, at the very end, I'm gonna talk about just a couple of things that the rules of professional conduct or the RPCs do not uh, address. So here's the structure of the rules. There are 56 rules in all. It begins with a preamble and scope and terminology. I'll tell you what's in there, but then we have eight articles. And I won't read these all now, but you can see that they range from three rules in article two to 18 rules in article one. And uh, we will run literally through each of those rules. So the introductory section, which is the preamble, the scope and the terminology uh, are background information. It's like reading the whereas's in a contract. 
the preamble states that a lawyer called, there's a section called a lawyer's responsibilities. Actually, that's the title of the preamble. Uh, it states that the RPCs are part of a larger system and that larger system of ethics includes uh, substantive law, procedural law, your personal conscience, it actually says that, and the approbation of your professional peers. So you are expected to behave ethically in a manner far beyond the rules, and the rules are a kind of floor to the system. Scope just talks about um, what these rules mean for you as a licensed attorney, and basically there's a note in there that if you violate the rules, you are subject to discipline. Uh, in terminology, there's a number of defined terms, as you might see at the beginning of a contract. Uh, one I wanted to point out to you was informed consent. There are a number of times in the rules uh, where a client is expected to give informed consent, where you are expected to require that from the client. And this helps define what goes into informed consent. Well, let's go to Article 1. Excuse me. Article 1 is the attorney-client relationship. And it's 18. it has 18 rules, and it is uh, the heart of what goes on between you and your client. So what are you expected to do? First of all, rule 1.1, be competent. Uh, you're supposed to know what you're doing and you're supposed to do it competently. Now the rule in the comments suggests that you can gain competence if you associate an attorney who's an expert in the field, if you consult with another attorney, or if you just do what is called necessary study. Now, 1.2, the scope of representation and authority between the lawyer and the client. The standard uh, mantra here is the client sets the objectives. The client tells you what he or she wants to have done, and the attorney sets the tactics. Now, it's not that cut and dried because the uh, client, uh, although can describe what the objectives are. It's up to you as the attorney to help the client get to that decision. And it's also required of you to discuss the tactics with the client. You are the professional, you get to determine ultimately what the tactics are, but you have to try to do that in consult uh, with your client. Uh, diligence is uh, simple enough. You have to be diligent in your law practice. Uh, the comment to this rule mentions that you are expected to be zealous in your advocacy, but uh, that you have the discretion to limit how you carry out your, uh, your professional advice. And for example, in litigation, how many rules, uh, how many uh, issues you're going to raise on an appeal. Uh, diligence 1.3 is fairly straightforward. Uh, uh, and then we go to 1.4, communications. Uh, this is an important one because you can substantially increase your success if you communicate well with your client. Now, the rule requires that you must inform the client what you're doing, you must respond to requests for information, and you must consult regularly with the client. Uh, if there's one thing that annoys clients, it's to be spending a lot of money on you, the attorney, and never hearing from you. Well, fees, rule 1.5. The basic rule, of course, is that fees must be reasonable, or I think as the rule says, may not be unreasonable. Um, the, uh, we've, we've talked at various times in these ethics seminars about fees. It's a rather significant rule with a lot of detail, uh, bear in mind that you must always explain your fees and the basis for them to the client. Uh, contingent fees have to be in writing, although uh, many of us would recommend that you put all your fee agreements uh, in a, an engagement letter signed by the client. But contingent fees have to be in writing, signed off by the client. 
And of course, you know that there are certain subjects such as obtaining a divorce or custody that cannot be based on a contingent fee. And you may not charge a contingent fee to uh, defend a criminal defendant. Uh, this rule, by the way, does have rules on uh, sharing fees among firms, and that's something to pay attention to. The general rule, of course, is that referral fees are not to be paid. Let's go to slide uh, uh, to rule 1.6 confidentiality. This is uh, what I call the first of the big two. The second one is 1.7 on conflicts of interest. When I teach legal ethics at Creighton, I would say we spend more time on these two rules than on any other. Confidentiality is, there's a basic requirement that you maintain confidentiality of whatever you're doing for your client, but there are so many exceptions and nuances to the rules, to that rule that you need to look at this uh, I would suggest of all the rules we talk about today, here's one that you probably want to reread for yourself. Uh, I, will, I will say that you may break confidentiality uh, in certain circumstances if, there's, if it's implied that you're allowed to talk to people about the case. For example, the, the attorney on the other side, obviously you're not going to get far without communicating with various people about the case. Uh, the, uh, another one uh, to pay attention to is the, one of the big exceptions is you may reveal information that your client doesn't want you to reveal if you are going to do it to prevent crime. And you can always reveal confidential information on a confidential basis to the ne Nebraska Lawyers Assistance Program. Uh, I note there that confidentiality is different from the attorney-client privilege. I will talk about that uh, toward the end of the presentation in that final sec uh, section. Conflict of interest, rule 1.7. Uh, the, I guess the best way to talk about it is you can't represent somebody if you are materially limited by your obligations to another client. There are extensive comments here. Uh, one of the biggest no-nos, I would guess, is that you may not bring a claim against a current client. Uh, when we look at Rule 1.9 on former clients, you'll see that you can bring a claim against a former client. We'll talk about that. But uh, the material limitation that you have might be your obligations to another client, it might be a personal interest of yours. Uh, gosh, this rule goes on and on. Uh, 1.8 is a carrying on of rule 1.7. They just split it up because there was so much material. This is what I have called here a grab bag of specific rules. Uh, rule 1.8 includes things like not providing financial assistance to a client. They, it's believed that that would uh, create a conflict in terms of now you are owed money by your client. Uh, you may pay, you may advance costs uh, of litigation. Um, another important one is uh, 1.8F, you may not accept a fee payment from a third person unless the client consents to it and it's clear that you are still representing the client and that that third person payor cannot interfere with the work that you're doing. This becomes especially uh, ticklish in a case where a, uh, the client might be a minor and the parents are paying the, the lawyer's fee. Uh, one thing I wanna point out here is that uh, 1.8 prohibits a business transaction with the client unless the, the terms are clear and, and the deal is, is favorable, is fair, let's say, to the client. And you must suggest that the client seek independent legal advice. Interestingly, if you change your fee, if you increase your fee, your hourly rate, for example, during representation, and you haven't set that up 
in your engagement letter where it might say that you may be able to raise fees from time to time and the client has consented. Well, if you raise your fee, that is considered a change in the business deal between you and the client, and that is a business transaction with the client, and you need to advise the client to get independent legal advice. Uh, rule 1.9, conflict of interest regarding former clients. This is a very nuanced rule. Uh, remember, with a current client, you may not sue a current client on behalf of another client. You may sue a former client on behalf of a current client if the matter is not substantially related to what you worked on for the former client. Uh, there's a lot of subtlety here. And I think if you're in a situation where you might be considering going against a former client, study this rule and, and make sure you understand it. Uh, rule 1.10, the famous imputation rule, says that a conflict of interest of one attorney in a firm is a conflict for everybody else. Uh, and you can't solve it by screening because Nebraska is not as generous as other states in allowing screening. Uh, rule 1.11 and 1.12 have to do with imputation to the firm if one of the lawyers in your firm is a former government lawyer or former judge. Uh, they can be screened and you need to look at that. Rule 1.13, the organization as your client, it's important when you represent an entity that you make it clear to whoever you're dealing with. Remember an entity is, isn't a live person, but it is represented by persons. You need to make sure that, that the person, the vice president or whoever you're dealing with at the entity knows that your client is not them, not that person, but the entity itself. And you are allowed to give individual legal advice to one of your corporate client's representatives, as long as there's no conflict between that person and the entity. Uh, this rule has details on reporting misconduct within the entity, and that is based on the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, legislation. Uh, now, 1.14, a client with diminished capacity. Uh, anytime you're dealing with such a person, whether it's a, uh, a diminished capacity based on uh, mental issues or uh, physical illness issues, or maybe a minor, or an, you might say an elderly person, uh, you must do your best to treat that person like a normal client. Well, that may be hard to do. This rule points out fairly clearly that you are not the guardian for that, per, that client. You are the lawyer for that client. And if you need decisions to be made, uh, you may have to seek the appointment of a guardian ad litem or other guardian to make those decisions. Uh, 1.15, we've talked about this from time to time in these seminars and that is safekeeping uh, property of a client. Now it says property, but mostly we talk about trust accounts and client funds. Uh, you know that that is a major source of uh, discipline and you also need to be very organized about your trust accounts. Uh, 1.16 has to do with declining or terminating representation. I think the simplest way to summarize this is you can't take on a client if the representation might involve your violating the rules of professional conduct. You just can't take that on. And once you're representing somebody, if you find that you are being pushed into ethically questionable territory, you may need to terminate the representation. This rule also points out that the client can always fire you for any reason. Uh, for whatever reason, the representation might be terminated, do limit the harm to the client on the way out the door. And the rule talks about giving files and things like that. Uh, sale of practice, uh, this isn't something that happens every day for most lawyers, but uh, the, the key point here is you can sell your entire practice or parts of your practice, but you can't sell individual cases. That would start to look like a re referral fee. Uh, duties to prospective clients, uh, it's a, a fairly new 
rule, rule 1.18. And you have to bear in mind that anytime you talk to somebody uh, as part of an intake process, you may be creating a conflict of interest. So the rule cautions you to limit the amount of information you take from that person uh, just enough to find out if there's a conflict or if you can take on the matter. Uh, there is a risk if you turn somebody down and say, I'm sorry, I don't take that kind of case. There is a risk that that client may think that you are representing them. And there's some famous litigation on that. I point you to the Togstad case from Minnesota on that one. I've talked about that in several of these seminars. Well, okay, let's get on to the other rules. Rule two or article two is fairly simple. Rule 2.1 doesn't tell you to do anything. It says you may give more than legal advice. That is to say, you may base uh, what you advise the client on factors other than pure law. That is moral factors, ethical factors, uh, political, social factors. You may do that. I don't know how you could probably advi possibly advise somebody without bringing those things into it. Uh, evaluation for third persons, uh, rule 2.2. What we're really talking about here in my experience is something like writing a legal opinion on behalf of your client, which you're offering to a third party, such as a lender, a bank, and your client is the borrower and you give a legal opinion on the, corpor on the corporate status uh, and, and other aspects of your client's uh, situation. Interestingly, the rule dodges the question of what duties you owe to the recipient of that legal opinion. The rule focuses on protecting your client in that process. And so unless it's really clear that the client understands that you are going to deliver certain information to the other side, you can't do it. You have to protect your client. Um, a lawyer acting as a mediator, an arbitrator uh, in rule 2.3, uh, you need to make clear what your role is and that you are not representing either side. And this is especially important if one of the sides is unrepresented. Article three, lawyer as advocate. So here is litigation material. And I'm sure those of you who are litigators are quite aware of many of these rules, but let's run through them. Uh, 3.1. Uh, meritorious claims. Under the ethics rules, you're not allowed to bring frivolous claims. They have to have merit or a good faith argument that the, the law should be changed. Uh, similar, these, this rule is similar to FRCP 11 and the Nebraska statute 25.824. Uh, there is a little more leeway given to criminal defense lawyers to raise arguments that possibly couldn't have been raised by someone else in a different role. Uh, so you know that in FRCP 11, your signing a pleading is your own representation that it is not for an improper purpose uh, and is warranted by existing law or a non-frivolous argument that the law should be changed. And the Nebraska statute says something similar. Uh, this, uh, you, you've read recently about these Colorado lawyers who made election challenges on behalf of the Trump campaign, and, and they were recently sanctioned. I'm, uh, I'm delivering this uh, recorded message to you on August 16, but just a few weeks ago, these Colorado lawyers were sanctioned for a substantial amount for bringing frivolous claims to challenge the election. Now, those sanctions didn't come under rule 3.1. They came under the federal rules of procedure, uh, rule 11. However, uh, it's fair to say that something as stark as what they did in the judge's mind could very well lead to an ethical challenge to those attorneys uh, wherever they are licensed. Uh, and in Colorado in particular, where they carried this out. Uh, rule 3.2. 
expediting litigation. Uh, no tactics are permitted merely to harass the other side. You have to have a good reason for your tactics, and that is somewhat similar to the meritorious claims rule, 3.1. Candor to the tribunal. No false statements of material fact or law in representing a client. And uh, we do know that uh, you do have a duty to disclose contrary law, controlling contrary law, but you don't have a duty to disclose contrary facts. Uh, the other side is supposed to develop their own facts. Uh, one exception to the facts part is in an ex parte hearing, you are required to disclose contrary facts. Now, this rule uh, 3.3, uh, is similar to uh, a rule 4.1, I think, that we will get to in just a bit. Uh, fairness to the opponent. Uh, the emphasis in rule 3.4 is on discovery and, and being fair. Now, it's possible to play hardball, but it's also possible to go too far and do everything you can to prevent the, the system's expectation of rather wide open discovery. Uh, at the same time, you, you can do more than just block the other side. You can also uh, inconvenience the other side by massive frivolous uh, discovery requests. So rule 3.5, uh, candor to the tribunal or uh, fairness to the tribunal. Basically, this one says no ex parte contact with judges or court officials uh, and no disruption of the trial process of the litigation process. 3.6, a very detailed rule on uh, trial publicity. Uh, not something most of us have to deal with, but uh, it bears reading once in a while if you're in a case that's in the newspapers. Uh, trial lawyer 3.7 as a necessary witness. Basically, if you are a necessary fact witness in a matter that you are the advocate for, uh, you can't do that. You may be able to bring in somebody from your law firm to take over for you. Uh, there are a few exceptions. Prosecutors, uh, Rule 3.8, the main focus here is that prosecutors are ministers of justice. We are all officers of the court, but prosecutors are ministers of justice, according to Rule 3.8, and they are to act fairly with regard to the uh, accused. Uh, Rule 3.9 uh, has to do with non-adjudicative proceedings uh, and that would be, they would apply most of these fairness and um, delaying rules from 3.3, 3.4, and 3.5 to non adjudicative proceedings. Uh, 4.1. Uh, this one gets interesting right now. Uh, the focus in Article 4 is dealing with others. And there are four rules here dealing with others, uh, truthfulness. It says that there, you are not to make false statements of material fact or law, and that has to do with your activity as a lawyer, not just in litigation, not just in court, but in general in representing a client. Well, this is the one that got Rudy Giuliani sus uh, suspended a few weeks ago from the practice in New York, and then DC went along with it. Uh, basically, the court in New York found that he had made such outrageous false statements about the election that uh, he had violated this rule. We will see what comes. Uh, we've already seen that there could be problems ethically for bringing frivolous lawsuits, but here you are in terms of outside court making false statements. Uh, uh, Mark Weber, uh, of the, the Nebraska Council for Discipline indicates that there is some movement of foot in Nebraska to expand this rule to cover an attorney at all times and not just in representing a client. I will be very interested in following that process. Uh, 4.2, contact with a represented person. It can happen innocently and, and it, can also, it can happen uh, when the 
when the representative person contacts you. That certainly happened to me a few times. Uh, the fact is you may not speak with an, a, a represented person without that person's attorney's consent. Not that person, but their, their attorney. Uh, 4.3, dealing with an unrepresented person. Basically, you have to remind them over and over again that you're not their lawyer. You can't give them any legal advice. The, the only advice you can get give them is get a lawyer. Uh, but that said, uh, many of us in practice at one time or another are going to be dealing with somebody who is representing himself or herself. Uh, rights of third persons, 4.4. Uh, this is a broad statement here really where it says that uh, you may not use means that have no substantial purpose other than to uh, delay or harass or inconvenience another person. And basically it means that your loyalty to your client and your duty of zealous advocacy uh, does not override a duty to be fair to others. We roll on to Article 5. The law firms, unauthorized practice of law. There are seven rules here. Uh, rule 5.1 says that a supervisory lawyer, that is supervising another attorney, partner supervising associate, for example, has to ensure that that uh, subordinate attorney behaves ethically. And should you uh, really shirk your obligation to do so, uh, you may find yourself subject to uh, an ethical violation for not properly supervising. And of course, should you tell that, uh, that subordinate attorney to do something unethical and they do it, uh, that's on you. Now, rule 5.2 says it's also on them. And there is, you can't just use the uh, just following orders excuse if you're an associate or any kind of subordinate attorney. And uh, you violate the ethics rules and try to defend yourself saying, well, that your superior told you to do it. Uh, there are nuances in 5.1 and 2, and I invite you to look at those. Um, 5.3, non-lawyer assistants, paralegals, staff, and so on. You, as the attorney, are required to make sure that ethical conduct takes place. Uh, and again, should you be uh, shirking that duty, you may find yourself up for an ethical violation. Uh, professional independence of a lawyer, interesting title for this one. Basically, it goes into no fee sharing with your staff or with other non-attorneys and no payment of referral fees. Uh, 5.4 also says you may not have a, a non-lawyer person as a partner in your firm or uh, an officer in your firm with, with any control over lawyers. Uh, rule 5.5, unauthorized practice and multi-jurisdictional practice. Uh, details here about things like pro hoc vice uh, admission in another state. Uh, and should you be involved in multi-jurisdictional practice, sit down at some point and read 5.5 and the comments, please. Uh, 5.6, restrictions on right to practice. Basically, a lawyer cannot be subject to a non-compete with a limited exception that if you retire and take sort of some sort of retirement benefits from your firm, uh, a uh, reasonable non-compete would be enforceable. And law-related services, 5.7, uh, if you provide services other than law advice, to your clients like financial planning, escrow, and so on, your activity is subject to the RPCs, whereas people who are not lawyers who are doing those same services are not subject to the RPCs. We may make it here. We're in Article 6. Uh, public service. Now, these are there, uh, they, they aren't something that most of us would pay attention to. This may be the only time in years that you'll hear about these. So here we go. 6.1, you are to aspire to do pro bono work. Some states have a target hour, uh, hourly, uh, yearly hours, uh, like 50 hours a year. You are to aspire to do it. Uh, you are not required to do pro bono. 6.2 has to do with court appointments. And essentially it says 
don't duck your obligation to accept court appointments. Uh, if, if you are assigned a case, you'd better have a really good reason not to take it. Uh, I mean, like a conflict of interest or something. 6.3, legal services organization. Uh, some lawyers sit on the boards, for example, of legal services organizations, and you're, you're free to do that. You're free to help uh, the uh, spread of legal services to underserved communities, for example. Uh, so you may participate as a, a lawyer or an officer in such a group, but you have to be aware of potential conflict of interest with your clients. That's a messy subject. Uh, you're going to have to think about that and maybe look at that rule. 6.4, law reform activities. Well, lawyers, uh, the bar is regularly testifying in front of the legislature about changing this or that law. Uh, rule 6.4 gives you guidance on potential conflict with your clients. Uh, you may be promoting a, a change to the law that might be somewhat harmful to your own client. You are permitted to do it, but you need to have your antennae up and functioning. Uh, rule 6.5, limited legal services programs such as nonprofits or court appointed uh, legal services programs. Uh, basically, if you participate in something like that, the rules for determining conflict of interest are somewhat more relaxed. Article seven. Advertising and solicitation. We've got five rules here. Uh, rule 7.1, communication regarding your services. Well, I, I put the word truthful there, which may be hiding behind the little uh, screen of me, but the word truthful is there. What the, law, what the rule actually says is that your communications regarding your legal services may not be false or misleading. That, that doesn't say how you do it. It's just any time you communicate, presumably as well in a conversation with someone. Uh, rule 7.2, advertising. Uh, your right to advertise is very well established as a result of a number of uh, constitutional cases, First Amendment cases uh, in the US Supreme Court going back 50 years. Uh, However, your right to advertise is limited by rule 7.1 on truthfulness and 7.3 on live solicitation. Now 7.3 limits, as we all know, direct solicitation of legal work. Uh, the main exceptions are here. You are allowed to directly solicit legal work from family, friends, and those would be social friends or uh, you're, you'll have to decide. Uh, clients, you may solicit more work from your clients and other lawyers. Now the lawyers part is interesting because let's say you want to approach a company and you want to get legal work from them. If they have an in-house attorney, you are free to go and solicit. But without that, you're going to have to be very careful. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm a member of the bar of the state of Washington and I'm gonna tell you what the state of Washington has done on rule 7.3, I think is very interesting. They have flipped rule 7.3 on its head where, where 7.3 in the Nebraska version says you may not solicit directly and, and, and directly means live face-to-face -face on the telephone, live uh, internet chat. You may not solicit directly legal work. Washington now says you may solicit professional uh, work unless it's false or your what you do is false or misleading um, and unless the solicitation involves coercion duress or harassment that would probably be the emergency room waiting room or the emergency room bedside sort of thing and, uh, and so is the other exception, and that is you may not solicit if you know or reasonably should know that the physical, emotional, or mental state of the subject uh, of, of the person you're soliciting, uh, that they couldn't exercise reasonable judgment. So Washington has opened it up to where you can now start passing your card around at Rotary and things like that uh, without worrying about it. Uh, 
we'll see if Nebraska and other states look in that direction. All right, 7.4, communications about your field of practice. You're allowed to say you specialize. You're allowed to say your practice is limited to certain fields like family law, but you, the only restriction here really is that you can, first of all, they have to be truthful. That takes you back to 7.1. You can't say I'm a specialist in family law where you've never handled a case. But uh, the other restriction is don't use the word certified, like I'm a certified uh, family law attorney or a state planning attorney or whatever. You can't say that unless you are certified. And the rule goes into who gets to do the, certify, the certification. Uh, 7.5 has detailed rules about firm names and letterheads. Rule 8.1, uh, five rules right here, truthfulness in bar matters. And uh, the first one is when you apply for the bar, you have to lay it all out and be totally truthful about your background. Uh, we do occasionally see people coming out of law school who have something questionable in their past and now they're finding themselves faced with a bar application. Uh, the other time is in disciplinary proceedings. And, and the uh, main rule, uh, when I played basketball in high school, uh, sometimes you'd get the ball stolen from you and you want to go foul the guy that did it. And the coach would say, don't compound your mistakes. Well, in a disciplinary proceeding, if you get that letter or call from the council for discipline, you better open up, you better be truthful. And if you aren't, then you have compounded your mistake. Uh, 8.2, truthfulness regarding judges and legal officials. And that has to do with not making untrue statements about such people. Uh, 8.3, reporting professional misconduct. Uh, this is one that uh, is a bit scary be because we don't go around complaining officially about other lawyers. We don't call Mark Weber every time somebody does something. But you must report if a person's uh, behavior calls into question their fitness in other respects. In other words, have they done something, not just this one instance, but have they demonstrated their unfitness in other respects? If you draw that conclusion, you must report them to the disciplinary authorities. Uh, 8.4 basically says, if you violate any of these other 55 rules, you are subject to discipline. Uh, 8.5, the authority, the discipline authority, the governing law. Well, for those of you who are practicing in your home state where you are licensed, you know who the authority is. It'll be the Nebraska Supreme Court or the Iowa Supreme Court. Uh, however, if you violate ethics rules somewhere else, that state's Supreme Court uh, can discipline you and it'll come back and haunt you in your home state. Uh, the governing law is an interesting question. It's a bit nerdy, but basically, if you violate the ethics in uh, a, an ethical rule of Iowa, while well, you're doing something in Iowa, uh, you are subject to the Iowa law and not the Nebraska law. All right, uh, we're going to go now. We've got a few minutes left to talk about what the rules do not address. There are a couple of subjects that are left out and the rules in their comments uh, state this. You'll find references to these things. Uh, re remember then that some aspects of your obligations as a lawyer are subject to the common law, statutes, and of course, procedure. You know that at any time you uh, step into court, you are subject to the rules of procedure. Well, uh, there are three rules uh, three subjects that are critical to the formation of the attorney-client relationship. Uh, there are three subjects, one of which is formation. So uh, formation is governed by basically contract law and agency law. Uh, under the scope at the very beginning of the RPCs in paragraph 17, you will find a reference to the fact that the RPCs don't tell you whether a, an attorney-client relationship has been formed. So then you'll have to look at contract and I believe agency and bear in mind that 
the entire set of RPCs is based on the common law of agency. Uh, number two, the attorney-client privilege. And uh, I could teach this every year for the next 20 years and still stumble on it, I believe. Uh, the simplest thing to say is that your ethical duty is rule 1.6, confidentiality. You violate that and you are subject to discipline yourself through your disciplinary authority. So rule 1.6 is your ethical obligation. The attorney-client privilege arises uh, out of procedure. And the attorney-client privilege isn't your ethical duty, it's a right of your client. You just have to think of it that way. Your client is entitled to attorney-client privilege, but you have an ethical duty under Rule 6.1 to maintain confidentiality. And those things are different. They have different uh, details to them. So uh, we talk about that a lot in uh, my professional responsibility course. It's, uh, it's a bit tricky. And lastly, malpractice. The rules make it clear that they do not determine your tort liability to your client. Uh, they say you have to look at other sources of the law and we're really talking about tort law here. Uh, a, a violation of the rules of professional conduct does not directly give rise to liability for malpractice. However, again, in the scope section at the beginning, paragraph 20 says, that a rule violation may be evidence of breach of the applicable standard of contact. Well, that's, that, that's a definition of negligence there, a breach of a standard of, contact, uh, uh, of conduct. Now, uh, I have uh, served as an expert witness in a number of cases, and uh, that is to say malpractice cases. And the question that I'm brought in for is, Let's talk about what is the standard of behavior under the rules of professional conduct. Again, I'll, so I'll testify on that and I'll say whether an attorney, in my opinion, has or has not met the standard of the rules. That doesn't necessarily mean malpractice, but you can see that if, if, you, are, if you have committed a rather clear violation of the rules of professional conduct, and your client's been harmed, uh, it's not that hard to make a case for malpractice. So there we are, folks. Uh, my 45 minutes is up. Uh, there is the layout again of the rules. I call them your RPCs available 24-7. Uh, you're going to learn a few other things in this year's seminar as you have in previous seminars about the details of these rules and some of the latest developments and so on. That was your drone's view, and I have been droning for 45 minutes. So I thank you for your attention and uh, enjoy the rest of the seminar. Okay, let's get started. Um, so hello, Omaha Bar Association. I am Kendra Frische, and I am a professor at Creighton School of Law. I teach a bunch of different courses, but the one that's probably most pertinent to this conversation is that I teach professional responsibility and I work with the students, obviously, getting them ready to take the multi state professional uh, responsibility exam and help them think through questions of um, ethics and professionalism, which is our very important duty as law professors, but sometimes isn't always that obvious and easy to do in courses where um, we're talking about, you know, what the rule for battery is. And I also teach torts and criminal law. So that's where that came to mind. Um, so what I'm talking, my topic today focuses on what I call just right lawyering, um, sort of the Goldilocks sense of what's the appropriate amount of interaction with a client um, and what's the appropriate amount, or importantly, in many respects, uh, of deference that we give to a client. So the, I, my, I've called this just right lawyering, how to avoid overpowering or under counseling clients. 
Okay, so what do I mean by that? First, um, what I think about in terms of this idea that perhaps sometimes lawyers overpower their clients, we've had some pretty notorious examples of this, the most um, recent of which is uh, the, the Britney Spears conservat conservatorship battle, um, which has been in the news quite a bit. And that has really revolved around the question of whether her conservatorship is being appropriately handled, um, if it still should continue, if her father should be her conservator. It's been an ongoing conservatorship that's lasted more than 12 years. And, um, and for, which is somewhat extraordinary, particularly for someone who's as famous as Britney Spears is, that she does not have the capacity to control her money or uh, make major decisions for herself is of importance and should be analyzed closely. However, that's not actually what interests me the most about the Britney Spears situation though. What interests me the most is actually her relationship with her attorney. It, when I saw the news reports and started kind of following this with some cursory interest, um, what struck me was that her relationship, she has an attorney, um, which a lot of people don't, right? We don't have that kind of uh, guidance from an individual who's trained in the law when sometimes we wish we would, we could have that guidance. Um, but she does have an attorney and her attorney is her attorney. Her attorney is tasked with the responsibility of counseling her. So she made a comment to the judge um, in one of the recent hearings about how she was unaware of some of her power in this circumstance of this challenging the conservatorship and it piqued my interest and started me kind of pulling this thread of what does it mean for an attorney to be perhaps overpowering and over authoritative with clients um, and reminded me of some other instances that I've had in the past. So that's one side of the spectrum that, um, that made me curious and started me thinking along these lines. The other side of the spectrum is when clients are perhaps under counseled because we perceive them to be sophisticated enough that they don't really need our guidance as attorneys as much as perhaps a, 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 a client who is not as sophisticated. And here's a good example of that. So this is an older example, obviously, but we have a fairly notorious um, situation here where Enron was behaving in ways that were ultimately determined to be fraudulent and getting a lot of help from uh, attorneys in that process. And in that circumstance, it's perhaps more appropriate to consider that as problematic because the clients were under counseled. They were perceived, and again, this is not, I'm not saying that I've done any deep study on this, but what strikes me is that there are circumstances in which attorneys might think that the clients need less handholding because there are, um, you know, they're big corporations or they have in-house counsel um, and perhaps we defer more to the client in that circumstance than we would in another. Okay, so those are the sort of bookends of my thoughts on the sort of extremes that we might fall into as attorneys when we're counseling our clients. Um, but what do the rules say? What are our responsibilities to our clients ethically when it comes to giving them advice, right? So the Nebraska rules of professional responsibility um, are, you know, that have obviously multiple provisions and multiple uh, contexts and circumstances, but the, there are three, I think, that are the most important here. Um, so the first is rule uh, 3-501.2, which dictates the allocation of authority between lawyer and client. And we know, you know, you know this, but it's helpful, a little helpful reminder that lawyers must abide by a client's decision regarding the objectives of representation, the goals of the representation. So the litigation, it might be that uh, the client chooses to settle and the attorney is not permitted to overturn a client's decision to settle a case. Uh, in a criminal context, if a client wants to take a plea deal or wants to reject a plea deal, that is the client's call. And similarly, on the other side of the coin, if the client wants to reject a plea deal or reject a settlement and, went, and decides to proceed to trial, that is the client's call and an, an attorney is not to overturn 
that determination by the client. I mean, the reality is, after all, these are our clients' cases and we are helping them. We are not the ones who are actually going to ultimately suffer the consequences or pay the price of a, a, a you know, of, of these cases. So we need to really listen to our clients in that regard. 3-501.2 also mentions that lawyers must consult clients regarding the means by which those matters are to be pursued. And that next, so that takes me to the next rule, which is cross-referenced here, um, which is rule 3-501.4, which specifically lays out rules about how lawyers are supposed to communicate with clients. And so while the client holds the power to make the determination about the ultimate goals of representation and whether to how and how to meet those goals, the means by which those goals are met are actually more within the lawyer's control. So lawyers, but lawyers must, within reason, consult with a client about the means by which the client's objectives are to be accomplished. So even though we leave the power to lawyers to make decisions about how to reach the client's objectives, we still do have an obligation as attorneys to consult with clients about how we're going to get to those ultimate results. What that means and the you know, level of specificity we need to have is unclear. But, it, but we do know that we can't just decide to do everything our own way um, without having some communication with the client about how this process is going along. You all know from having worked with clients that you can't necessarily, you, it would make little sense and would be inefficient to explain to a client every single thing that you plan to do in order to meet the goals of representation. And so there's choices to be made here and, um, you know, and some flexibility, but you can't just refuse to tell the client how you plan to go about the representation. And you must comply with reasonable rest requests for information. Um, reasonable is in there. Reasonable saves us to some extent. We can't, you know, clients can't run us around um, the, through, run us through the ringer in terms of giving, you know, information every day. Um, but if a client asks for updates, occasional updates on how things are going and what you're planning to do in the course of the representation, um, we must comply with those reasonable requests for information. All right, the last rule that I think is important to this concept or these concepts of under counseling or overpowering clients is the idea that we have responsibilities to clients with limited or special capacity. So section 3-501.14 lays out how, you know, lays out some admonition. It's not honestly very particularly instructive um, in some circumstances, but, you know, it is what it is. We have to work with what we have. Uh, the rule tells us that when a lawyer works with a client with diminished capacity, it could be a minor, could be someone with a mental infirmity, um, could be someone who's elderly and maybe not technically mentally infirm, but maybe struggling to, um, to, to make decisions like he or she did in the past. Um, the rule says that the lawyer shall, as far as reasonably possible, maintain a normal client-lawyer relationship with the client. This is the exact same language out of the same rule in the model rules of professional conduct. And as I say to my students in professional responsibility, that language is pretty broad and pretty squishy. We don't get a real sense of what it means for a lawyer to, as far as reasonably possible, maintain a normal client-lawyer relationship with a client who is, say, five years old. You, by design, will be interacting with a client who's very young or very elderly or mentally infirm um, than you would with a client who's not in any of those categories. Um, the rule, however, gives a little bit more information and the Nebraska version gives a little more information about what it means to maintain a normal client lawyer relationship with the client, um, which is that the comment states that the rule uh, requires lawyers to consult clients who likely will have opinions about their own custody 
that deserve to be given some weight. So if, for example, you have, and the comment even uh, mentions very young clients, if you have a client who's maybe six or seven, um, that client can almost certainly, if handled properly and, and communicated with properly, understand the concept of expressing an opinion about custody. Um, you know, kids, very, very little kids can start expressing themselves very, very well on big questions, right? Or things of very personal importance to them. And the idea here is that the rule is telling us that we can't just insert our own judgment because the client is young or older or uh, mentally incapacitated in some way. Um, so these, these three rules, communication with clients, you know, deferring to clients on big issues, big questions, um, you know, goal, uh, goals of representation kinds of things, um, communicating with clients about the means of representation and complying with reasonable requests for information, and then also working with clients of limited capacity or special capacity as best you can are all our ethical responsibilities as attorneys. And my fear and the sort of thesis that I have um, for this talk um, is that I, I fear that we see lawyers not doing this and not actually thinking as carefully as we should about how we interact with our clients, particularly when our clients are vulnerable. So on the one hand, we have the rules that uh, we've just reviewed. On the other hand, we have this idea um, and these ideas that we are taught both at the law school stage of our careers and even out in practice that sort of maybe conflict to some extent with these ethical rules. Um, and what so the concept that I have here, and it helps maybe with a little context, I think in terms of analogy, as do all of us, I think in the profession that we are in, um, one of the things that it helps me to think about is uh, something that a colleague said to me at a prior institution several years ago, um, where I was teaching um, I was teaching several courses, but also at the time serving as associate dean for academic affairs. And my colleague on the faculty said we were talking about uh, curricular reform and whether we needed to be making different decisions about what students are taking, what are required courses, what are uh, recommended courses, pathways through school. Uh, we had identified that students were actually, and as always is the case, extremely talented, the client, the, our clients, well, our students are our clients, I suppose, but our students are very clever at avoiding things that they don't want to do, and they will find a way if there's even the smallest opportunity for students to avoid something that maybe is a really important thing for them to do, uh, they can avoid those things by being uh, smart and, and thoughtful and careful. And sometimes I want to say to students, the level of care that you have taken to avoid instruction in this area is indicative of your very fine ability to be an attorney. But if you would use that power for good instead of for avoiding the work, uh, that would be that would be ideal. So anyway, my, my colleague said to me, the problem with curricular reform or the challenge that comes along with it is that unless we are extremely particular in what we require the students to take, we can never actually fully address the shadow curriculum. And I thought, okay, this sounds strange, but interesting. Tell me more, what is a shadow curriculum? He, his theory was that the students actually, and this is true at every law school in the country, students will listen to us when we, we require them to act in a certain way. Makes sense, they're at law school, they, they, they're rule followers and they want their degree, so they have to. However, if, for example, it's, you know, evidence is offered in the second, third year, and you find that every person taking evidence or pretty close to every person taking evidence is a 2L, even though it's offered to 3Ls as well, so they could wait and take it in their third year. If you start seeing a pattern develop where the students are taking 
evidence in the second year. It's likely a result of the shadow curriculum, which is the, the sort of peer inputs that students have. Um, how much information are they getting from each other? How much are they listening to each other when it comes to setting up their law school path? They are getting a ton of information from each other and they are very closely listening to each other, even more than they're listening to the faculty and the administration. Um, they trust each other. They, they, they feel like that peer relationship is more important and more significant um, to planning for their future than the people who are paid to do this for a living and make recommendations. So this idea of shadow curriculum stuck with me and made me realize that there's a whole lot that students learn in law school that we don't control or, and more importantly, in this context of what we're talking about today, we are actually teaching them things all the time that we don't necessarily have it as an objective of our teaching when we put together our syllabus. In other words, we often teach through our uh, modeling and through uh, how we, you know, sort of how we approach our um, relationships with our students. We tell them and, and, and model for them to be confident and to convey authority that their job as attorneys is to be soothing to their clients and one way, one way to be soothing to a client and helping this client feel like they're in good hands is to be confident and to convey authority. So that's good, right? Being, you know, knowing who you are and, and, and that you're good at what you do is a very helpful thing. The problem is that it can tip into this overpowering sort of relationship with a client who perceives him or herself to be unsophisticated and incapable of evaluating certain questions when in fact they have under our ethical responsibilities they have the absolute control when it comes to the ultimate decisions in their um in their case or in their deal or whatever it is that they are working with you on so that confidence and authority might overrun the, the client. And, um, and we've taught that to you in law school and lawyers teach it to each other, right? To have this really clear sense of authority and confidence. And it's not a bad thing, but sometimes it can go too far. On the other end of the spectrum, um, we are taught to be as lawyers, we are taught we're in a service profession, that we are to listen to our clients, uh, that we are to defer to our clients, all of these, again, very good things. Um, and that maybe in some circumstances, the client is oh, maybe almost always right, maybe not always right, but almost always right. And that in those situations with, where we've got, you know, a potential problem with Enron, for example, we have a potential that our deference to the client and the customer is always right sort of attitude on the other end of the spectrum is too far and that we're giving the client too much deference and maybe sending the message to the client that the client doesn't actually, uh, it, it's not of much value to listen to the lawyer's advice or even ask if the client should behave in a particular way because the client knows the lawyer's gonna tell them, go ahead, whatever, you know, you're good to go. Again, outliers, but the potential for harm is there. So, Depending on the context, a lawyer can be overbearing or too deferential with clients and fall out of compliance with the ethical rules that we have discussed here. Um, coupled with that, we're well-meaning. We want to do the right thing for our clients. We want to soothe them by being confident and authoritative. We want to make them feel like they're being heard by being deferential and, um, and you know, and, and sort of... Uh, listening carefully and letting them take the, the lead. Um, but as always, the, the, the way that we should approach these cir circumstances is often somewhere in between, right? Not too authoritative and not too deferential. Um, so these, these potential directives uh, or the directives that we have under the rules potentially guide us into good lawyering that's sort of balanced in this way. Um, the problem is if we fall out of compliance with these rules, 
we actually run the risk of really, you know, harming potentially vulnerable clients or putting clients that don't appear to be vulnerable in a really vulnerable position. Um, okay, so clients come to us a lot of times because they're vulnerable. If you work in a field that is, um, you know, an area in which I have done a, some scholarship and some and a lot of teaching, uh, family law. Clients come to attorneys for help in family law context because they're at a bad point in their lives. They're they're struggling, um, and so the most vulnerable clients are often the most likely to be subject to to being overpowered. Uh, not to say that every attorney in those roles does it, but sometimes clients come to us essentially asking us to make tough decisions for them. Um, and the more difficult it is to counsel a client in that circumstance, it's likely the more crucial good counseling is. So if the client really kind of makes it hard where you feel like this client really just needs so much of my time and attention, and um, is, is just very needy. Those are the circumstances where it's possible that the attorney can actually be too, uh, too you know, overpowering for the client and end up making decisions for the client that you shouldn't be making. On the other side, the less vulnerable a client seems, the more likely it is that the, the client can be under counseled and find themselves in a big pot of hot water because, uh, because they are not listening to attorneys and they're engaging in very problematic behavior. That ironically, the under counseling maybe for the non-vulnerable client makes them vulnerable, right? As soon as Enron was not getting the advice that they were looking for or more accurately in the Enron circumstance, the lawyers were overly deferential to the client in issuing opinion letters that the client was doing things that were perfectly legal when they actually weren't ultimately deemed to have been legal. Um, that client, that lawyer-client relationship made Enron um, vulnerable to later, uh, you know, legal action because the lawyers um, were giving bad advice. Um, you know, I, I like to think like the Titanic, uh, actually hold that. Um, no, nope, that's where we're going. Okay. So these vulnerable clients, let's think of it going back to Britney Spears and Enron. So the most vulnerable client is most likely to be subject to overpowering. Britney Spears is not someone that most people would necessarily think is a vulnerable client. She's famous. She's got a lot of money. Um, and she is, she has a lot of support. She's got a lot of people around her. And yet, when she was be standing before the judge in a hearing not too long ago, asking for her conservatorship to be changed, to be either lifted or to be re uh, to be reassigned so that her father is not in the role as her conservator, she explained to the judge, and I quote, this is from the transcript with the judge uh, in, the, in one of the hearings that, uh, fairly recently, uh, Britney Spears said, ma'am, I didn't know I could petition the, the conservatorship to end it. That's what caught my attention when she said, I didn't know. And my thought was she has an attorney and there's no chance her attorney didn't know that she wanted to end the conservatorship. This has been something that she's made quite clear. She did not actually want to continue with. Um, now, look, I know we don't know and I can't know all of the facts here. It's entirely possible that her attorney was giving her excellent advice and told her multiple times that if she wanted to change the conservatorship, that she needed to petition the court to do so, and that it was a possibility um, it's also possible, in fact, that she, you know, had in her head that she was making clear that she was unhappy with the conservatorship, but wasn't, didn't, that maybe she didn't actually have that conversation with her lawyer. And um, it was, it's legitimate possibility that the lawyer was just in a position of being unaware. However, if she's telling the truth, this could be a pretty bit, pretty big example of some really bad lawyering. Her attorney is hired, was hired 
to look out for her best interests, to communicate with her. And even if she's, even though she's a vulnerable client and she has special capacity to work with her as closely as possible in a normal lawyer client relationship. So not only should her attorney be telling her, yes, there is a way to end the conservatorship. And we, these are, this is the process that we need to go through to do that. The attorney then should also be making recommendations if the client is very serious that she wants to end the conservatorship, her attorney should be advising her and how to do that. The judge can decide whether or not it's appropriate to end the conservatorship, but it is not the lawyer's job to head her off from something that she wants to do. That's a pretty big ultimate goal of representation to end the conservatorship. And in this particular circumstance, because the attorney was not hired by Britney Spears, the, the attorney was chosen by someone else because Spears wasn't even permitted to choose her own attorney. The, it, it smacks perhaps of an attorney trying to hold on to that steady paycheck. Because if the attorney is successful at cutting her loose from the conservatorship, the attorney may not have that client, you know, that client relationship will change and the income will change. Now, that attorney did actually unravel his, his relationship with Brittany because she was permitted to choose her own attorney and her attorney of many years said, it's better for me to just step away so she can choose her own lawyer. And that's what happened there. But I wonder about the interim years and whether that attorney was choosing to withhold certain information from her um, thinking, and it's this is the challenge, thinking he's being a good lawyer. This isn't a decision that she should make. She's not mentally capable of doing it. It might upset her, um, but this is something that she might wanna know. And the attorney is in a position of trying to decide how to deliver that information. I will submit that the attorney might have a tough job having that conversation, but that the attorney can't not have the conversation to, to be within our ethical constraints. Um, okay, so that's Britney Spears. Other vulnerable clients don't get hearings that are covered by the press. And in fact, most difficult circumstances that include vulnerable clients are not public. You know, we have lots and lots of circumstances where clients, particularly minors, aren't, uh, you know, that their cases aren't heard in the public. And it's possible, and I've heard anecdotally from colleagues throughout the years, um, or attorneys that I've known in the capacity that I've um, worked with in my family law area of interest, um, there's a lot of communication going on, again, anecdotal evidence, but a lot of communication going on between attorneys for kids and either opposing counsel and or the judge that does not include the kid's permission. A lot of signaling, a lot of ju judges and lawyers just kind of making decisions about how to move forward without the kid's knowledge or approval. Obviously there are kids who are young enough that they can't have, they're not old enough to have an opinion or, or be able to express it. But the comment to rule uh, 3. Oh, uh, excuse me, 3 501 working with special capacity clients specifically says there are even young, very young kids who might have an opinion about a big deal issue like child custody. Think about kids who are in their teens and are in the juvenile justice system, uh, might have a pretty strong opinion about where they're placed. And all too often, conversations about where those kids go are not um, including the kids. And lawyers are just kind of stepping in under the guise of helping kids come through a difficult situation by not putting them in a position, putting them in a position of having to make choices, difficult choices. Yes, they're difficult choices, but it is not the lawyer's role to decide to withhold information to protect a client even if the client is vulnerable. And almost especially if the client is vulnerable, we are not in a position or should not be in a position of being a gatekeeper 
for information. We should be sharing information with our clients. Okay. Um, on the other side, no, okay, so that's the vulnerable side. Uh, the clearly vulnerable client who comes through the door with vulnerabilities. On the other side, back to the Enron discussion of perhaps under counseling clients. Um, you know, and the Enron debacle is sort of one of those situations where Enron was the Titanic and unsinkable until it became the Titanic and sinkable. Right, uh, the the initial sense of uh, the people who designed the Titanic was that it's unsinkable, right? It can never go down. And then on the first maiden voyage, it goes down in a, a spectacularly tragic situation. Enron was sort of similarly situated. It was a big, powerful company, kind of doing no wrong. It was, you know, it was it was doing big money, big business, and and plugging along. Um, it seemed invulnerable. In the process of the sort of hubris of the people running Enron, uh, relying on advice from attorneys uh, and support and uh, sort of you know guidance from attorneys to to engage in behavior that was ultimately determined to be so risky and volatile that it actually wiped out a huge uh, you know huge amount of money and a huge amount of uh, retirement uh, plans for for people who worked for Enron really was extremely financially damaging. That situation was in part created because lawyers were not actually giving good advice. They weren't having the difficult conversations, they were under counseling and giving in to bad ideas that the client had. This is not the first time, right? This happens with some regularity. If you see headlines about a spectacular implosion of a, of a large corporation or entity, it's at least at some level may be in part because attorneys were under counseling that client. The savings and loan scandals of the 80s is an example of this, but more particularly, the, one of the better examples of this um, was the tobacco companies, uh, use of lawyers, in, um, in, in trying to keep secrets from the public and, um, and basically continuing to uh, allow people to harm themselves through smoking by saying that they didn't have any particular information that smoking was harmful well past where everybody knew that smoking was harmful, right? So the tobacco companies actually were using client confidentiality rules and privilege to protect themselves from having to release research that showed that the that tobacco use was damaging. Um, what they figured out was as the public became more and more clear that tobacco usage could cause cancer, the companies needed to be able to say without, you know, lying, that um, that they were doing studies and that they were looking into whether cancer is caused through tobacco use. And of course, those studies and that research, they knew would generate information that in fact conf confirmed that tobacco causes cancer. And so what the, the tobacco companies did was they created a research arm, supposedly independent research arm that would study the effects of tobacco use and the research arm would report to the lawyers for the tobacco company. So the lawyers for the tobacco company would take any damaging or negative reports from the research arm and put them under the privilege and therefore would not communicate any of that information to the public. The idea to do that, I don't know if that came from the lawyers or if it came from the tobacco companies, but regardless, the tobacco companies relied on lawyers and were not told by the lawyers that that was a, an unethical or improper use of attorney, uh, pri attorney client privilege and confidentiality. And then in fact, that was, an, that was a wrong way to rely on the attorney, uh, on the attorneys in that circumstance. So hiding information by using relying on the attorney client privilege and um, confidentiality is clearly the sort of thing that we don't want lawyers doing. 
but the lawyers didn't appear or were at least complicit in that behavior through perhaps under counseling the client and what the right thing to do in that circumstance would be. And through those extremely risky behaviors for Enron, uh, for the savings and loan scandal uh, you know, situation, and for the tobacco companies, they, those companies were making themselves more and more vulnerable and, help, and using lawyers to help them. So when we don't follow our ethical responsibilities with respect to deference and communication and working with special uh, capacity clients, we are either working with people who are already quite vulnerable and maybe making them more vulnerable, um, or we are taking clients that are, are in theory, um, when, they, when we start working with them, are not vulnerable, and we make them vulnerable by letting themselves self-destruct. Okay. Not all circumstances are, are this extreme and you, you know, presumably in your practice, you're not seeing or feeling like these, these sorts of things are quite so um, dire or problematic as these headline grabbing situations. Um, but it's the little interactions that can also be problematic and they can add up. And so, my suggestions and how to avoid perhaps overpowering or under counseling clients take several forms. The first is everything points back to communication. Everything about a good client lawyer relationship is rooted in as much good, solid, honest communication as possible. Um, just checking my watch here to see how we're doing on time. Okay. Um, all right. So, Communication breaks down into a few different categories and thinking about how to avoid these pitfalls, um, think in these terms. You don't know more about your client's needs than your client does. You, you can't, right? You're not them. Only the, the individual is the one who knows the most, even if they're infirm, even if they're young, even if they're elderly, they'll still know more about themselves than you do. Even if your client can't communicate well with you, Seek whatever you, whatever help you can within other, you know, all of your ethical responsibilities. Do what you can to seek information about the client. And you can ask people in the client's orbit if you have um, a client who is mentally um, struggling and has perhaps, or has some sort of infirmity that makes it hard for them to make decisions, um, or they're, you know, they're struggling with dementia. You can perhaps talk to family members and say, what's the sort of, you know, what do you think is happening here in terms of um, the client's ability to process information? Um, you know, what, what's, what makes this, what soothes the client? What makes them feel better? How can I talk to your loved one in a way that's, that's um, not going to be upsetting? You know, sort of see if there are trusted sources that, you can talk to under the rules um, without violating the confidentiality requirements um, to help you better serve the client. Ask lots of questions and listen carefully. If the client is capable of answering questions, great. Um, think about what questions you want to ask and how you can ask them in a way to be um, to, to not be upsetting and to really open either even if it's a mostly one-sided dialogue from your perspective where your client can't really give you a lot of information just asking genuine questions and being open to listening to the responses will actually put the client in many respects will put the client at ease uh, and practice active empathy if you're working with someone's parent who's elderly and struggling to make decisions and needs help putting together a will how would you want a lawyer to work with your perhaps elderly parent? Just active empathy. Think about what it would, what, how people, how you would want the people in your life to treat you or to treat your loved ones. Try to think in terms of interacting with a client in the most um, empathetic way. Okay. So first idea, you don't know more about your client's needs than they do. Try whatever it is you can to get them to tell you what their needs are. Second point, 
lawyers are counselors. They're not surrogates. I realized I'm off, um, off uh, track here. All right. So lawyers are uh, counselors, not surrogates. Communication is key in this regard. Avoid erring on the side of informing your clients as much as possible. So if there's a question of whether I should talk to my client about this question, the answer is yes, try. However you might be able to make that communication happen, you should try to, to open that door. Um, the first and most important thing to remember is that you need to meet your client where they are. You can't, uh, I mean, literally and figuratively, go to them, um, help them if you can, if that puts them at ease, um, and, and put yourself in a position of talking to your client in a way that, um, that you think they can handle and that you think is uh, going to be the most possible opening of communication. Drop the legalese, try to figure out how to talk to clients with the most um, sort of uh, simple and straightforward means possible. Um, I know for me, we talk about this in law school, you can't speak to people with legalese, you gotta drop it out of your writing, it's just not, particularly useful for anybody. Um, and then I go to the doctor and I wonder if they, if they hear the same thing, because I feel like I can't have a conversation too often with my doctor because my doctor's rattling off very technical terms to me. And then I sit there and think, am I supposed to know that? Am I supposed to ask questions? Why are they talking to, why is my doctor talking to me in this way without realizing that I'm not also a doctor and I won't necessarily understand these terms. In other words, I think it's pretty easy even if we've been taught to avoid speaking to people um, in a way that they can't understand, it might be hard to remember that. And so we have to really think about who our client is and where they are and meet them at, at the place where they feel like you're actually trying to see their perspective and hear, um, you know, hear it from their perspective and they can hear you. So, um, and this, this is the uh, last point I'll make on this um, counselor, not surrogate idea. You are actually counseling, right? Counselor is a purposeful term. You are actually counseling the whole client. We also have an admonition under the rules that we should offer counseling to clients that is not related to legal advice sometimes. If someone's in legal trouble because they have an addiction problem and you recognize that, you are responsible for helping them with the addiction problem. Obviously you don't have to drive them to um, a, a treatment center, but you are responsible for having a conversation with them about perhaps solving their legal troubles or making their legal troubles better by acknowledging the inputs that are putting them in this bad position. So humility helps here coming at these these problems, not from a place of, I know better than you, and I'm going to tell you what to do with your life, but treating your client as a whole human, as someone who has worth and value and autonomy will go a long way to helping your client understand that you are simply helping, you are not stepping into their shoes, but you are going to identify problems with them and work through them with them. All right, the last thing. Be brave. <laughs> One of the things that um, you know we do as lawyers is we routinely have difficult conversations, right? Or we know we should. Uh, sometimes, because we have to do that so regularly, we might try to shelve some of those difficult conversations if we don't absolutely have to have them. But this is the hard part. The best way to meet your client where he or she is is to have all of the difficult conversations. If it's a difficult conversation, it's because it's important and it is something that needs to be addressed to help the client um, do better. Avoiding those tough situations, those tough conversations rarely will help matters later. Things will get worse and the difficult conversation will get more difficult if put off. So best to have the tough conversation and best to um, confront it as soon as you can. Um, advocate for your client to your client. Sometimes clients aren't very good at taking care of themselves and protecting themselves. 
and you can help them in that regard. You can say, my job is to help you, so I need you to help you. Um, encourage them to take an active role in helping themselves, even if it requires some brutal honesty, as I just said. That said, work to figure out how to be honest without being brutal. Um, there are ways to do that, to have a conversation that doesn't actually, you know, hurt as much. And a lot of times that means being empathetic and being careful and how you um, speak to your client. Practice, practice what you want to say. Think about it in advance. Um, talk to the mirror if you need to, to get through that difficult, at least have some words to start the difficult conversation and think about how it might sound from someone else's ears if you're just being, you know, sort of brutally honest. You might be able to say things in a way that's not quite so um, upsetting for a client and, and better to hear, easier to hear for a client if you practice a couple of different ways of saying it to yourself and see if there's a way to kind of soften or smooth some of the things you're saying so you're not quite so, um, you know, it, it's not quite so difficult. Okay. There are lots more uh, avenues we could take on this topic. Um, this is just one that uh, occurred to me after seeing these sort of public meltdowns that um, are all too often, and how a lot of them may feed back to this to this idea of um, open, honest, and careful communication with our clients, even when they are vulnerable. So that's all I've got. Thank you for listening, and um, I hope the rest of your seminar is a success. Welcome everybody to the Omaha Bar Association and Creighton University School of Law's 15th Annual Seminar on Ethics and Professionalism. This is an online presentation again this year, and we captioned it on the cover page there, the fall of 2021. Uh, hopefully we'll be back in the Harper Center next spring. Uh, with the Delta variant though, we, we just don't know exactly where we're gonna be yet, but we, we have reserved the Harper Center for next April. So hopefully we will be able to see everyone uh, at that time. What I've got today for you is an overview of the uh, ethics decisions uh, from Iowa and Nebraska and a few, few other states since the last uh, seminar. So basically since last September. And I, I wanna take you through the, some of those. There really wasn't a lot of information uh, to convey, but I think we found some interesting topics for you, even though uh, ethics and, and interesting are a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, the, uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, go to the next slide, which is the state of Nebraska versus Combs case. You can see it's a 2017 case. And the reason why I, I picked this case is because there's a more recent opinion coming from our Supreme Court that deals with some client attorney relationship issues that I think are very instructive and very helpful uh, for us. So we're not gonna be talking about this case, but we're gonna be talking about the next edition of this case. But I wanted to show this to you because in this case, it was a criminal case. It ended in a mistrial due to a jury deadlock. The Supreme Court held, when that was appealed by the defendant, the Supreme Court held that the retrial was not barred by double jeopardy since no verdict was announced in open court or accepted by the trial court before the mistrial was declared. So that there were some real procedural problems or nuances to the case as it related to the original jury verdict deliberations. And, and what happened was the jury had about three or I think it was three charges or maybe it was four charges, but they found unanimously that the defendant was not guilty on two or three of those but they got hung up on one of the counts, one of the charges, and couldn't reach a decision on that charge. And so they, but they never came back and told the court that they were deadlocked, such that the court entered a, a mistrial uh, before the, the judge had an understanding of what they were able to agree on with some of these other charges. So the, uh, the unanimous verdict was on two, of the, two or three of the counts there was one count that was not unanimous and they thought they had to be unanimous on all of the counts, which they didn't necessarily have to be. And in any event, uh, the Supreme Court rejected the claim of double jeopardy when uh, it ordered a retrial. And th that was this appeal from 2017, but it does lay the groundwork for the next opinion. 
And the reason why it lays the groundwork for the next opinion is that based on how the jury handled the first case and how close the defendant Combs came to getting dismissed entirely in the first case, he felt like he was not being treated fairly by the court system. And he wanted to take this up to the Supreme Court, which he did and he lost and he found that the court found that it was not barred by double jeopardy. Uh, his, his subsequent retrial was not barred by double jeopardy. But it, it, it's important to know that Combs, the, the, the defendant in this case and in the next case we're going to talk about, was charged and, and, and went through two different trials. And I think he was uh, he was believing he wasn't treated fairly. And that has some ramifications, I think, for some of the considerations later in the case. So we'll go on now to the state of Nebraska versus Combs, which is the 2021 case. And let's talk about who the players are so you have an understanding of who we're talking about here. Combs was a former announcer for the University of Nebraska football games in, in Memorial Stadium. And there was a lot of press given to his arrest and to his trials uh, because they dealt with uh, potentially or arguably, allegedly uh, taking money from older people through uh, adverse influences or abusive of uh, the relationship that, that he had with those, with those people. Uh, we'll get to those charges in a minute. The lawyer who represented Combs in both the first case and the second case is a very good lawyer, well-respected, uh, knows what he's doing. Um, and so you would think, well, why are we talking about this case then? Well, there's a lot of issues that came up in this case that I think are teaching points for all of us, and we'll get to those in a little bit. The district court judge was Robert Ott, very good district court judge uh, in Lancaster County. And the Supreme Court opinion in this case was written by Chief Justice Mike Hevigan, who obviously is a very uh, esteemed and, and good justice down in, in Lincoln at the Supreme Court. So uh, I think it's important for me to point out that I, I take no issue or I have no problem with what the defendant did in this case. I think maybe he could have done, a, not the defendant, but uh, the, the attorney, the lawyer, what the lawyer did in this case, although he could have maybe done a little bit more, and that's what we'll be talking about. But I have no reason to doubt that uh, he did not have a direction uh, to appeal the case. I have no reason to doubt the district court uh, finding that it believed the lawyer, and I have no reason to doubt uh, or take issue with the Supreme Court opinion that affirmed the trial court. But even though we're not going to take issue with the lawyer's conduct per se in this case, there are some issues that have that arise that I think are going to be good teaching points, not just on uh, criminal appeal cases, but other cases as well, as well. So let's get into it a little bit. Uh, as I mentioned, the second trial, Combs was convicted of several offenses, theft by unlawful taking, one kind of attempt, attempt at theft by unlawful taking, and abu an abuse of a vulnerable adult. Rather, he wanted his, his story was he wanted to appeal. The lawyer said, he didn't tell me he wanted to appeal. So the, the opinion is not an appellate opinion from the trial, rather it is a post-conviction relief opinion and following an evidentiary hearing conducted by the, the, the district court as to whether or not there was ineffective assistance of counsel for not failing or for, for failing to file the appeal here. So what we're going to be getting involved in here is a situation where the, the, the client said, I wanted to appeal. I told the lawyer I wanted to appeal. And the lawyer saying, I, I was willing to do whatever the client wanted to do, but he never told me that he wanted to appeal. And that's really the, 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 the factual issue that, that guides the case. But as you will see, we get into a lot of uh, collateral issues and corroborating evidence issues that are uh, of interest in the case. The fee arrangement is a good place to start with this. Um, the, uh, the fee arrangement is, and I think I'm one behind here. Yeah, the fee arrangement was, was helpful. Here it is, and take a minute to read that if you can read it on your screen, uh, because I think you will find it's confusing. What's partially confusing is the lawyer says there's $20,000 in the trust account and the balance due would be about 16,000. So does that mean that the, the Combs, the client, owes thirty-six thousand. It's it's not really clear. He then the lawyer then says, "I will accept a five thousand dollar discount if we do the appeal for a flat fee of ten thousand. Okay, 
$5,000 discount perhaps of the balance due. Okay, I'm with it so far. Uh, and then it says the $5,000 would be payable now and the $10,000 would be payable when the appellant's brief date is due. That's where the confusion really sets in. The $5,000 would be payable now why, why is that being paid now? What, what is that for? And is that, how do we, how do we square that with the lawyer saying in the previous sentence that he will accept a $5,000 discount? So it's a discount uh, on the 36,000 perhaps, but then in the next sentence, it's $5,000 that has to be paid to the lawyer. And so there's confusion there. Oh, and coming back to that for a second, you'll see I've got an asterisk at the very end of that. That's the little clue for me to let you know we're going to be coming back to this because this is one of the issues that we will get into in terms of potential uh, learning opportunities, we'll call them. The uh, May 29, 2018 was one of the key dates in the case where, where Combs emailed the lawyer indicating that he was inclined to pursue an appeal, but his wife had reservations about it. And then he said, we're, we're, we're sending you the $5,000 this week. So we, we will get to the 5,000 in a minute, but I'm always a little concerned when I see words like indicating, because it, it isn't that the, the Combs email the lawyer stating he was indicating something, but nevertheless, he was indicating it in an email. So the words say what, what the words are, uh, they, and, the indication was, according to the court, that he was inclined to pursue an appeal. So that's obviously something that the, the lawyer needs to take into consideration, uh, something that, that uh, would be guiding his, his decision making in terms of in planning for purposes of appeal. Then there was a phone call on June 8th and Combs testified in no uncertain terms that he told the lawyer he wanted to appeal. So we have the half of the he said versus he said situation arising on, as of June 8th. And Combs went further and said after uh, he told the lawyer that his wife, he and his wife celebrated that decision. It's kind of an odd thing to celebrate, uh, but I think Combs was trying to emphasize that he and his wife were both aware of this issue and they were both happy with the issue uh, once he elected to uh, inform the lawyer that he wanted to appeal. The lawyer, on the other hand, testified he received no direction to appeal during the June 8th call, but simply answered more questions about the process and in, in informing uh, Combs that he could file the appeal and later withdraw if he no longer wanted to pursue the appeal. Again, you'll see there I've got uh, two asterisks. The two asterisks there are to, to remind me to tell you that there's more up to this slide uh, later on because it's one of the key slides and key parts of the opinion. Good for you to know that the appeal deadline was June 13, 2018. So none of these discussions were appearing or what were, were taking place with uh, you know two or three hours to go before the courts closed or before the appeal deadline ran. Uh, in fact, the lawyer told Combs that he needed to know by June 11th whether he wanted to appeal. I'm sure the lawyer wanted to make sure he had enough time to do what he needed to do to get that appeal on file. On, on June 11th, the lawyer, this is again two days before the uh, deadline for the appeal, the lawyer checked his email and phone messages multiple times to ensure he didn't miss a message from Combs. Well, that's good. And it, it's good that he did that because he was waiting to hear whether Combs uh, had made a decision on this appeal. If he did not receive any word from Combs, uh, presumably the lawyer was not going to appeal. If he did receive uh, direction from Combs, it would be whatever Combs told him to do, either appeal it or don't appeal it. The, the issue here that you need to be aware of is that there's nothing in the record, in the opinion, to, to indicate that uh, the lawyer actually called Combs uh, that day or emailed him or reminded him about June 11th being the date that was kind of the artificial deadline for Combs to let him know whether or not he wanted to appeal. And, and I think the, the lawyer probably could have done a little bit more in terms of trying to generate conversation or communication with Combs uh, rather than just wait for Combs to contact him. In any event, that wasn't done. Uh, but had it been done, uh, we, we may not have ended up where we ended up with this case. Then moving on to the next slide. Uh, we're back to the $5,000 check. And this is interesting because 
the court in the opinion said that the check for $5,000 was apparently received by the bookkeeper for the lawyer's law firm on June 11th. Well, it, it wouldn't be a Supreme Court case or it wouldn't be like a law school exam that we'd be, problem that we'd be studying if the facts were nice and, and neat. Uh, the facts get a little bit messy sometimes. And in this one, we recall Combs said, we'd be sending you the $5,000 this week. Well, the check was apparently received by the law firm a week to 10 days after Combs agreed to send it. But nevertheless, there's no question uh, the court's opinion deals with the assumption or with the, uh, the factual finding that the $5,000 was received by the law firm. And it was received two days before the appeal deadline. So the question then becomes, what did that $5,000 represent? And we go back to the previous uh, fee agreement language in the email sent by the by the lawyer, and it's not clear whether that five thousand dollars has to be paid down on the balance in order to uh, get the lawyer to do the appeal, or whether the five thousand dollars was for payment of fees related to the uh, the appeal. It's just not clear, and the court makes it very very uh, clear a number of times that it was a confusing email. Um, and so it, it really cut both ways. The, the $5,000 was sent. It was apparently received. Uh, and then there, there's no check or can't copy of a cancel check part made part of the record. And you'll see I've got three asterisks there as well. And that's because I want to come back and talk about that part of the case as well, the further we get into it here. Uh, the district court judge um, found in the court, Supreme Court agreed that the lawyers spoke on June 8th about the possible appeal, but that's where the, the uh, testimonies differed and where a fact question arose. Um, there was apparently no agreement according to the lawyer, whereas Combs felt there was. In, in finding on behalf of uh, the lawyer, the district court judge made a note of the fact that Combs' wife had fa failed to corroborate his story. And the language I'm gonna read from it, um, the court made findings of the fact that it believed the lawyer's testimony over Combs' testimony because it found the lawyer more credible than Combs and because Combs' wife offered no testimony corroborating Combs' assertion that she was aware the lawyer had been directed to file an appeal on June 8th. And so I, I don't want us to get sidetracked on this wife corroboration issue, but there is a husband-wife privilege. Wives can't testify against their husbands. And it seems to me that the district court here is drawing an inference from the failure of the wife to testify in this in this case. Uh, and it just, I'm not sure that we the court needed to go there. And I'm not going to go there either other than to, just to say that simply because it's not germane to what we're talking about today. But uh, I, I, just to get a little curious about the court making an inference about Combs's credibility when his wife didn't testify. Uh, but that's for another day in another seminar. So the district court denied the motion for post-conviction relief. In so doing, it made findings of fact that the lawyer's testimony was more credible than Combs. And it found that the lawyer had no duty to consult further regarding the appeal, that the payment of the $5,000 was not a direction to appeal, uh, and that the evidence did not support this express direction for an appeal. Remember, Combs said expressly on June 8th, I told him to appeal. So what the district court found was it didn't believe Combs. It was a he said, he said uh, situation. And the court was by the finding in part C there, the evidence did not support an express direction to the lawyer that an appeal should be filed by Combs or on Combs behalf. That's the district court judge saying, I believe the lawyer and I don't believe Combs. So that, that we'll, we'll touch on that just a little bit as well. So the holding in the case is the trial judge uh, is re reflected by these propositions of law. Uh, the trial judge sits as a trier of fact in post conviction relief cases. That's important because the judge is the jury in those types of cases when there's an evidentiary hearing. When reviewing a claim of ineffective assistance to counsel, the standard review in the Supreme Court is clear error. So it, it basically, unless there is, not basically, the law is, unless there is clear error in the district court, you're going to be, or the district court is going to be affirmed in the Supreme Court. And part of the court's decision was based on the fact that counsel couldn't force a defendant 
to give an explicit response on the issue of a, an appeal. And then what this case is really in about, about then is when you can't force a, a, a defendant to give an explicit response on the issue of appeal, then if that's the case, how do you protect yourself? How do you plan for an appeal or not to appeal? And that's what really we're gonna focus on now for the rest of the discussion of this case. So first of all, we start off with the fact that in any case, it's unfortunate to say this, but you do need to protect yourself from factual disputes with clients. You don't wanna be in that situation. Uh, you wanna avoid those situations. And so the better documentation you have of your discussions with your clients, the less phone calls that you have and memos to the file that you have and the more emails that you have confirming this decision or that decision will go a long way toward protecting yourself. And so the, the documentation of these issues is clearly to the benefit of the lawyer. Uh, the, where we see that coming into play in this case is the, the lawyer didn't offer the uh, canceled check and apparently neither did Combs. It was apparently not in evidence, but that would have been one of the things that you presumably would have been corroborating one side of the story or the other, uh, but that wasn't uh, introduced into evidence. When we talk about these types of uh, discussions, we can't get away from the fact that it's important to have a good reputation because as we saw here, the district court judge believed the lawyer and didn't believe Combs. Now, Combs was not a habitual criminal. Combs had, uh, had been found guilty of, of, of three charges, but this was a situation where uh, the, the, the district court could have believed him. There was enough corroborating evidence that if the court wanted to go in that direction, it could, but the district court chose not to believe Combs' testimony. It found the lawyer to be more credible. Why was the lawyer more credible? Because the lawyer had a good reputation. The lawyer knew what he was doing. He practiced before this judge before. And it's in those situations, it's very difficult for a defendant to re recover or prevail on a motion for post-conviction re relief based on ineffective assistance of counsel, particularly when the district court is making findings of fact that it believed the lawyer's testimony and not the defendant's testimony. So if you don't have a good reputation, if your uh, standing with the court is not as good, you're not going to be as inclined or as likely to get those types of findings. Now, obviously you never wanna find yourself in that position where you need to rely on a district court judge to make that kind of finding as to your believing your credibility and not the, the client's credibility. But still, that, that was a situation where a very good lawyer in Lincoln found uh, himself in, in Basically, the decision of the district court came down to that very fact. Who do, we, who do I believe? So it's important to have a good reputation and good standing before the judges in, in front of whom you practice, uh, because you never know when it's gonna come down uh, to a situation where you might need to rely on their belief of your good faith or your credibility. The next thing we want to talk about are communications with client, and and the uh, the issue here is the terms regarding the payment of the fee. And again, I'll show it to you. Um, the court found it was confusing. It is confusing. Uh, where the lawyer says I'll accept a five thousand dollar discount if we do the appeal for a flat fee, but then in the next sentence says the five thousand dollars is payable now. So if it's a discount, why is it payable? If it's a down payment instead of a discount, well, that would make more sense, but the, the, the email didn't say that. So it's important to have these, anything relating to the fee, anything relating to the trust account in writing where the, the client understands what is being asked and how the money is being handled. On the other hand, if you don't communicate clearly, it not only doesn't help you, it could potentially hurt you to document these issues. And, and that's almost what happened here because one of the issues presented for appeal in this case was whether or not the $5,000 constituted a direction or satisfaction of a condition such that the lawyer should have proceeded to appeal. That, that, that issue arises directly out of this email. So keep that in mind. Uh, you need to communicate, first of all, anything about the trust account should be in writing. Second, anything about uh, payment of fees, whether they're for an appeal or not, should be in writing. And make sure when you put it in writing, you're communicating clearly. So, and then uh, this is just the next section talk of uh, the opinion where it talks about the, the court's finding that the, the email about the $5,000 was not clear. 
and the need to communicate clearly. So then we go on to the next issue. There is a potential solution here and the solution can be found in the lawyer's own words. What am I referring to? I'm referring to that section of the opinion where the lawyer testified he received no direction to appeal, but answered questions from Combs, including informing Combs that Combs could file the appeal and later withdraw if he no withdraw it if he no longer wanted to pursue the appeal. That's huge. And that's really the one of the big teaching points, I think, of this case. His lawyer recognized that one of the avenues to appeal, if he couldn't get Combs to make a decision one way or the other, then the, the default, when there is no decision, the decision is then to file the appeal because you haven't, the client hasn't told you one way or the other what he, he or she wants to do. Is that to the disadvantage of the client? Well, I don't think so because if, if the, the case has been appealed, the client can then tell you later on, I want to keep the appeal or I, I want you to dismiss the appeal. You at least have that, the benefit of more time by, by filing the appeal, but more importantly, you've protected the client's interests by filing the appeal. And so if there's any doubt, if there's any ambiguity in the communications between you and the client, whether it was to whether file appeal, and that's whether it's a criminal appeal or a civil appeal, you should file the appeal. And you can dismiss it later if, you, if the client elects that they don't wanna pursue the appeal. So that, that could have solved a lot of problems here because obviously we wouldn't have an, an, an appellate opinion on whether or not uh, the, the lawyer was directed to file the appeal. So on jurisdictional things like this, you need to protect yourself. And uh, this is akin to something we've talked about it in this se seminar uh, on uh, other occasions, whether you don't know whether something done by the court is a final order. And if you don't appeal within 30 days, then maybe you've waived your right to appeal, you likely have. Or on the other hand, if it isn't a final order, uh, you go up in the Supreme Court very quickly or the Court of Appeals very quickly dismisses the case on the basis that it's not a final order. Well, if that happens, you, you can treat the filing fee, whatever it is now, 300 bucks, something like that, treat that as the, co the cost of a malpractice insurance policy because you're gonna lose some time you're gonna lose a few bucks in, in, in taking the appeal, but better to do that and not be facing a client that's unhappy, that says you should have appealed uh, or you, you should have taken some action with the court uh, rather than, uh, than not. And this is also applicable in cases of new lawsuits. For example, if your client can't make a decision whether or not to appeal, the statute of limitations is running, if the client doesn't have another lawyer to represent them to make that decision or to help them, it's incumbent upon the lawyer to make the decision to protect the lawyer. And if you're protecting you, you're protecting the client as well. You should, you should go ahead and file the lawsuit if there's any doubt if the statute of limitations is going to run. Obviously, if the statute of limitations is not going to run, you've got time. But if, if, if the statute of limitations is going to run today or tomorrow, something like that, rather than and then hope the client had made the decision that they don't want to pursue the case, go ahead, file the lawsuit. You can always dismiss it uh, if, the client, if the client then lets you know that they don't, are not interested in, in pursuing the litigation. And there again, the filing fee treated as the cost of a malpractice insurance policy. So there's one more issue that we wanted to talk about uh, in this case, and that's the trust account or operating account issue. Remember, there's $5,000 that apparently, again, using the court's words, was paid to the lawyer and is received by the lawyer's bookkeeper. bookkeeper. Um, so what, if that was $5,000 to pay down uh, an outstanding balance, it would go where? It'd go in the operating account because those fees have been earned. If it was $5,000 that was for payment of toward the, the appeal, but the appeal had not been undertaken, the brief had not been written, anything like that, then that would have to go in the trust account. And so the, the old adage about following the money applies in this case as well. So again, we, we look at the, the, the language from the court opinion about the check being apparently received. It doesn't say whether it was deposited in the trust account or the operating account. And depending on which account it was deposited in, would inure to the benefit of one or the other, either the client or the lawyer in making their arguments about whether there was an obligation to appeal or not. Uh, but 
the, for some reason, the parties did not take the check or a copy of the cancel check and make it part of the record. Uh, so we have only, we can only assume what happened. But one of the things we do know is that if $5,000 was paid to the law firm, it had a duty, those are client funds. And if there's any question about what those clients, those funds should be for, they should go into the trust account until that question is resolved. The other issue in terms of duty of safe, safeguarding client funds, not cashing the check is not an issue, not an option. I mean, you, you, if you've got client funds in your hand and you don't know what to do with them, they should go to the trust account. You shouldn't take the, the check and put it in the desk drawer and forget about it or say, well, I'll deal with that later because you're not safeguarding those client funds at that situation. But the record apparently, and the, certainly the opinion were silent on that issue uh, in terms of whether that was uh, deposited in the operating account or the trust account. Um, but anyhow, that, that's one of those issues that could have decided the case and, ch and changed the credibility determinations by the court based on how the money was handled, but we just don't know. So that, that's the, the, the last of the teaching points, I think. Other than to just focus on a few questions, what would you have done in this situation? I think we can all agree that the decision and the discussions about the appeal and whether or not to appeal could have been documented in a better form, in a better fashion. The less uh, phone calls you have discussing this and the more emails you have that are being exchanged, the better, because that gives you a record. If you ha are forced to rely on phone calls, then dictate a memo to the file after you've had the phone call with the client relating the conversation because that serves as corroboration for your testimony and your credibility. Uh, that's, that's an important point because you can't always say, look, I wanna to talk to you only on email on this, so let's have an email discussion. Obviously you need to talk to, to clients over the phone on many occasions and your only option on many occasions is simply to do a contemporaneous memo to the file on anything important that you're discussing with the client. That will cer certainly help you in the future. You could also perhaps address the issue of the appeal and the engagement letter where there's a default perhaps where you're, you're not going to, to appeal this case if it gets to that point uh, where there's an opportunity to, to appeal without the express written direction of the client. There again, it's not bulletproof. You, you could have a client giving you oral written direction and then there's a dispute uh, between the parties as to whether or not that direction is adequate under the circumstances. Uh, again, it's not perfect, but dealing with it in an engagement letter at least gives you something that addresses the issue from the outset. Finally, the default course of action uh, is, is really easy here. Uh, you should avoid a dispute with the client while protecting yourself. The ways you can avoid these types of disputes is by not making decisions to act or not to act in a way that's going to affect the client's rights negatively. So in this situation, it probably would have been the better course of action to file the appeal, not to, not to say that the, the, the lawyer had directed the client to do so. The, the lawyer was justified in not filing the appeal, but in, in looking back on it, to avoid a trip to the Supreme Court and an evidentiary hearing in district court, um, the, the filing of the appeal, particularly with the history that this defendant had previously being unhappy with how uh, the, the first trial went, you could see that uh, this was a potential problem. And so to avoid that problem, uh, keep the client's interests and your interests aligned. And the best way to do that is to go ahead and file the appeal. So that was the discussion in the Combs case. I hope that was uh, somewhat instructive and helpful because it, it's not just for criminal cases. It has applications to civil cases as, as well and it goes to the heart of the attorney-client relationship. All right, let's talk about ethics opinion 2002. This is a complicated opinion in terms of uh, the facts. I'm gonna try to stay out of the facts as much as I can here. Uh, but basically the trustee brought a, a couple of lawsuits against certain defendants um, the non-party, meaning the, the persons who are not defendants in those lawsuits, uh, beneficiaries of the trust had expressed a desire that they would like the trustee removed and they would like him to resolve or dismiss the district court lawsuits. They thought he was depleting assets with these lawsuits. So the, the beneficiaries of the trust were against the trustee suing these people uh, in, in the lawsuits. 
the beneficiaries were not parties to the district court lawsuit. They were on the side, uh, but they didn't have the money to take on the trustee in this case. So the interesting thing, what the defendants in the district court lawsuits decided is they said, look, let us fund your lawsuit against the, the trustee to, to remove him from his position. And so the question was, can, can that be done ethically? Can defendants in a lawsuit fund a lawsuit brought by somebody who's not a party to the case against the plaintiff uh, to achieve a certain result? And the issue is, can the lawyer ethically do so? Because while the parties themselves, uh, it may be a little bit of indirect pressure that's being put on and may, may not sit well with some people, uh, it, the rules of professional conduct don't apply to them, to those parties or to the clients they apply to the lawyers. And so it, can the lawyer get in trouble for acting upon this, uh, either on behalf of the trust beneficiaries receiving the funds and taking action, or on behalf of the defendants uh, paying the funds? And basically the, the rule in Nebraska, as it is in most uh, states, is that a lawyer may accept compensation from a third party, such as insurance companies, for example, as there is no, in, so long as there is no interference with the lawyer's professional judgment and the client gives informed consent. So the key there is the professional judgment of the lawyer. If somebody else is paying your fee, if somebody else is funding the litigation, can you maintain your independence to advise your clients properly? And you may, must be able to maintain your independent judgment. So as long as the lawyers are selected by the beneficiaries to maintain those ethical obligations, the lawyer can accept funding from funding from the defendants and could take action to remove the trustee based on the, those those parties paying his fee. It's it's an unusual case, but it's a, it's a good example of the independent judgment rule and the fact that third parties can fund litigation. Right. Let's talk about a new reprimand that was issued by the Eighth Circuit to a federal judge in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Iowa. We won't obviously name the judge, uh, but he's a current sitting judge. And the issue here, uh, it doesn't happen very often that you find eight, uh, district court judges being reprimanded by the Eighth Circuit. So I thought it was noteworthy and worthy of mention here today. Uh, the judge was commenting on a, a pardon that was issued by then President Trump uh, regarding $73,000 that had been paid in exchange for an endorsement. Well, what did the judge say? Well, he stated in a phone interview, an interview, it's not surprising a criminal like Trump pardons other criminals, but apparently to get a pardon, one has to be either a Republican, a convicted child murderer, or a turkey. And presumably the turkey reference is the, the pardon of the, the Tom the turkey uh, every year at Thanksgiving by the, by the president. Um, anyhow, pretty strong words. Uh, obviously, you can tell where this judge lined up uh, on the political scale. Uh, but the fact of the matter is he's got a lifetime appointment. Um, he's a judge. And whether you're a defendant, whether you're Republican, whether you're pro or anti-Trump, I think we can all agree that comments like this from a district court judge probably are a little too harsh. And the Eighth Circuit opinion thought so as well, Eighth Circuit court thought so as well. Uh, so the judge did acknowledge his comments were wrong and he did apologize. So uh, good to, to see that that happened. It's also a reminder to us that judges are human too, and judges can make mistakes too and make comments, even in interviews uh, where they say things that maybe were flip, uh, maybe were intended to be funny, but could be taken the wrong way. So uh, it happens to the best of us. Now let's talk about a change in the rules of professional conduct that are being recommended by the ABA. And if you've gone to this seminar before, you'll know that I've been not a great big fan of the ABA simply because I think they're a little bit out of step with uh, the, the, the common attorney client situation uh, in the situations that at least lawyers in Iowa and Nebraska run into. Um, the ABA may have a different view of those. And so they wanted to include a humanitarian exception in Rule 1.8. What that exception basically said well, first of all, this is what, a, what it says now, both in Iowa and Nebraska, a lawyer can provide financial assistance to a client in certain limited circumstances. For example, a lawyer can advance court costs and expenses of litigation, which may be contingent, the repayment is contingent on the outcome. 
just like the fee. The lawyer representing an indigent client may also pay the costs and expenses of litigation on behalf of the client. So those are situations where expenses can be paid or that those types of expenses can be paid by the lawyer on behalf of the client, but they all are, all are tied to litigation. The ABA said, okay, well, we wanna expand that. We wanna ex give indigent clients more opportunities to receive financial assistance. So they offered some justification. They said, well, let's make it so the relief can't be conditioned on the retention of the lawyer. Uh, let's make it so the, uh, the, uh, the condition is justified on the basis that the assistance can't be loaned so there's no effect on the lawyer's judgment and the lawyer can't offer assistance until the retention is actually made. So he can't use this as a carrot and stick. I will help you out with these expenses if you hire me. Uh, so the, the way the, the ABA rule was drafted, the model rule except uh, am amendment was drafted was based on these factors. And this is what we came, they came up with. The proposed model amendment to uh, 1.8 would be available to lawyers representing a pro bono indigent client, or if you were working at a nonprofit legal service representing an indigent pro bono client, or if you were working through a law school clinical program representing an indigent law school, uh, an indigent pro bono client. Those three situations, you would be authorized to give additional financial assistance beyond litigation expense, but food, clothing, uh, rent, uh, those types of things would be authorized uh, by the lawyer or by these services to provide to indigent clients. So lawyers who are not allowed to provide such humanitarian aid for food, transportation, medicine, and other basic living expenses includes everybody else in private practice. So that includes every plaintiff that's, that's representing someone who they may be funding litigation, who may be indigent, but if it's not a pro bono case, you can be representing an indigent client, uh, but because you have some hope of receiving a fee in the future due to the fact that it's a contingent fee, you, don't, you are not allowed to provide this under the model rule to provide this humanitarian aid for food, rent, transportation, and et cetera. It has to be a pro bono client. So I, I think that this rule uh, either should not be passed at all uh, and should be rejected and we should maintain the status quo. But if, if, if not, if we're going to breach this, this wall and, and allow these additional expenses to be paid in certain circumstances, they should be entitled to be paid by, uh, by lawyers who are not simply representing pro bono clients uh, or it should be paid by, by lawyers who are not simply members of legal clinics or uh, legal aid or those sorts of things. They should be able to base their, their right to pay for these types of expenses uh, on the, the need experienced by the client. Um, if, you're, if they're going to do this type of, or permit this type of payment, it should be much broader than what's being contemplated here. Um, I think the better course of action, and hopefully the ABA will, will, will not prevail here, the states will reject this and will keep the current funding limited to litigation expenses because you really open a Pandora's box if this ABA exception comes uh, into play for food, rent, et cetera. And then the last case I wanted to talk to you about was briefly was a, a, an opinion over in Bettendorf, Iowa. A 69-year-old lawyer was accused of violation of Rule 8.4 uh, of the model rules or the Iowa Rules of Professional Conduct. And you've heard me say this many times before, Rule 8.4 is the sledgehammer. That is the, the rule that if you're engaging in bad conduct uh, of just about any kind, criminal, sexual harassment, those types of things, uh, criminal conduct, you're going to be charged with violation of 8.4. And that's what happened with this lawyer. Uh, he was charged with uh, indecent exposure and sexual assault. So those were violations of rule 8.4B. Um, 8.4G makes it a separate offense to engage in sexual harassment. Uh, 8.4 also makes it an ethical violation when an attorney cr commits a criminal act that reflects adversely on the lawyer's honesty or trustworthiness. So the key point here is that it, not all criminal acts are prescribed or, pro or prohibited by the ethics rules and the, the rules of professional conduct. But if the criminal act 
reflects adversely on your honesty, your trustworthiness, or your fitness for a lawyer, then that is a separate ethical violation. Something to keep in mind. Uh, the court found that uh, the sexual harassment charge had been proven, but that uh, the grievance commission that voted for the other two charges as violations of the, the rule had not been proven. So the court suspended the attorney's license indefinitely with no possibility of reinstatement based on the sexual harassment part of the charges. So to, just to recap, not all crimes are eth ethically actionable. It has to affect your trustworthiness. Uh, you don't need to be convicted of a crime for criminally related conduct to be ethically, ethically actionable. And last, sexual harassment is eth ethically actionable without a crime being committed. Hopefully you'll never be in those situations in the, the, the situation where you have to address any of those issues, but it's just uh, good to know what 8.4 uh, covers and how it works. All right, we're on to the fastest five minutes in ethics. Uh, again, we're back to the Trump campaign. One of the Trump lawyers apparently filed an affidavit in federal court uh, in Georgia. Uh, and as you know, affidavits or declarations or verifications are often signed under penalty of perjury. In this case, the lawyer representing uh, Mr. Trump filed a verification. As you will see here, I declare and verify under plenty of perjury that the facts contained in the foregoing verifi verified complaint are true and correct. So he was, it wasn't under penalty of perjury, it was under plenty of perjury. So I, I think this is kind of interesting when we think back to the first case we talked about today, the Combs case, and how that hinged on the credibility of the, of the lawyers practicing before the district court. And, the, and he was believed. Uh, these are the types of things that call a lawyer's credibility into question. Uh, you could see it was probably dictated and not, and not transcribed properly. Uh, but it came out to be plenty of perjury instead of penalty of perjury. It does not make you look good as a lawyer when that's what you're attesting to. Finally, just a reminder, this, this comes up all the time, and so that's why I, I feel compelled to talk about it all the time. Uh, in this case, uh, in Iowa last year, um, the attorney received payments on a flat fee basis. If you get a flat fee payment, put it in the trust account. If you have earns part of the flat fee by doing some of the work, then okay, split it up such that part of it goes in the operating account, part of it goes in the trust account. And then if you have an issue with the client or even if you don't have an issue with the client, either at the, in, the, in the pendency of the, of the matter or certainly at the end, make sure you give the, the client an accounting of how the money has been allocated or spent, uh, particularly any money going into the trust account. And in this case, the lawyer, the lawyer didn't put the flat fee in the trust account and the lawyer did not provide an accounting. And so the grievance commission recommended a public reprimand. So just remember, flat fees are not earned until, unless you've already done the work. If you have to do the work to, that's pertaining to the flat fee, put it in the trust account, take it out later and claim it as operating mm -hmm. income uh, received for, or based on fees that have already been performed. But until those, those services have been performed, flat fees belong in the trust account. So to clear up our, our case, what have we learned? Sometimes a lawyer needs to protect him or himself or herself from the client. And we talked about in the Combs case how that can happen. Uh, always err on the side of an issue that provides benefit to the client and hopefully to you as well. But if it doesn't benefit you both, then err on the side of providing benefit to the client. And last, plenty of perjury is enough to affect the credibility of your affidavit, so keep that in mind. That's all we've got. I hope to see you all in April of 2022, and, and uh, hopefully we will have plenty more to talk about in ethics at that time. Thank you.